Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to another video series. This time we are covering the month of October. What an ugly month it was. It gave off 2022 vibes. And actually, since the end of summer, the end of July, it's been like that, where the Fed is unclear about what they're going to do next. They're talking tough on inflation. Inflation continues to trend down, but there's been some false starts. The economy's coming a little hotter uh, than the Fed would probably like. So it all is a, a jumbled mess. And anytime there's uncertainty around what the Fed does next and you throw in all the geopolitical issues, you get the market the last couple months and everything has gone down together. Bond yields have gone up, which is uncomfortable for those with a diversified portfolio. But there are some silver linings. So we're going to unpack earnings, the GDP print, what the Fed might do next, what's driving market returns, what's working, what's not working. So I'm going to share my screen and let's get into it. Okay, I call this one the Federal Open Mouth Committee, and it seems Chairman Powell opens his mouth, the market tanks. And I'm recording this on November 1st, so he's going to speak today, and it wouldn't surprise me if we start out strong and then the market tanks. One of our third-party research partners actually tracked uh, modern-day Fed chairs and market reactions, and Chairman Powell's the worst by far. So I don't know what it is. I don't know if he's talking tough, but the market doesn't like when he opens his mouth, hence my tongue-in-cheek Federal Open Mouth Committee. All right, the month of October. So like I did last month, I like to show folks what happened in the month of October, and it was pretty ugly. So this area here is the start of the month, and over here is the end of the month. And I threw in a bunch of different asset classes, gold, was the best performing asset class followed by cash and short-term treasuries. And gold's an interesting case because gold was at a seven month low before the war broke out. After the war broke out, gold just spiked higher, which was right somewhere in here. But again, gold, cash, short-term treasuries, even longer-term treasuries held in there quite nicely. Tech stocks sold off, S&P, foreign stocks, emerging markets, real estate, small cap, all took it on the chin. So it's a little uncomfortable when everything is going down together, but there were some signs uh, that investors were flocking to bonds uh, as these geopolitical tensions flared up. So zooming out a bit, this is the S&P 500 the last two years. And I think a picture is worth a thousand years. This has just been a whipsaw, weird market. Let me move my face so compliance can see the source here. But this has been an absolute whipsaw. Of course, this starts Basically, at the peak at the end of 21, markets broke down rather quickly. There's been a few bear market rallies, uh, followed by several drops. It looks like we hit bottom, knock on wood, in October of 22. Of course, 2023 has been pretty good, but then we're getting this nasty correction that we've seen over the last three months. So this is not unusual. Every year usually sees a drawdown of at least 10%, but these are some violent moves. And, you know, this is driven by a lot of, uh, you know, the best performing stocks, the tech stocks selling off, which we'll see in the next slide. But this is really tough to market time. This is really tough to predict. Of course, hindsight is twenty twenty, but this is just a very uh, whipsaw heavy market where it's easy to get caught off sides, right? Like this could be a pump fake. The market rallies, you know, you start to add equities here and then it tanks. Uh, same thing up here. Same thing up here. So, you know, we want to keep an open mind. We want to be flexible, but this has certainly been a ugly period as the Fed tap dances around what they do next. Now let's look at the NASDAQ, which is basically a more intense version of the S&P 500. So you can see the patterns are roughly the same, but these numbers are big, crooked, and ugly. So range of outcomes for big tech is much wider. I think there's been a narrative that tech is the new safe haven asset class. I would counter with this chart saying that's probably not true. A lot of these tech companies that are up 40, 50% this year that have been driving the market higher, when you zoom out, they're still underwater when you look at where we came from at the end of 2021. And of course, many of these tech companies got smoked back in 2022. So we're not saying you can't own them. We certainly own them in several of our individual stock models, but you need to be mindful of position sizing. Contrary to the current narrative, uh, big tech stocks are not a safe haven, as uh, safe haven asset class. Uh, you know, you look at some of these stocks down 50% last year, up 50% up this year. That's just a wild journey 
Uh, so those folks just sh should be mindful of that. Be aware of how much risk you're taking in position sizing and FOMO, fear of missing out, piling into them, uh, the best performing stocks, because that usually doesn't end well. All right. So let's look at the NASDAQ. So let's keep with the theme of tech stocks relative to U.S. small cap stocks, which have been, have been beaten down and out of favor. So NASDAQ stocks have performed well. U.S. small cap stocks deeply out of favor. And what this is, this is a ratio of technology stocks relative or divided by U.S. small cap stocks, which is the Russell 2000. So the higher this ratio gets, the more fully valued tech stocks are, the more out of favor small cap stocks are. We've only seen this current level of extremes back in 1999 and early 2000. And we all know what happened then. We were in a massive tech bubble. Now, the two periods are not the same. So granted, back in 99, 2000, companies that weren't making any money were slapping .com on the back of their company name and seeing their stock price go up by up, you know, 100% in one day. That's not what's happening now. These big tech companies are spinning off tons of cash flow. They're making money. They're investing in research and development. They have large dynamic workforces. They're great places to work. So it's a little bit different, but by any metric, by certainly this metric, U.S. technology companies are stretched relative to U.S. small cap stocks, which again, we've only seen these level of extremes back in the height of the tech bubble. So this is something to watch. So either tech stocks need to come down a bit, or U.S. small cap stocks need to rally a bit, or you know, it could be a combination of the two. But certainly, this is probably not sustainable. Okay, keeping in that same top-heavy theme. So what this is, this is the S&P 500 in blue, up about nine percent relative to the S&P 500 S&P 500 Equal Weight Index. So the Equal Weight Index is like the name implies; it's the same 500 companies the S&P owns but it owns them equally. So 500 companies owned equally. The S&P 500, on the other hand, is a market cap weighted index, which means the biggest companies represent a larger percentage of the index. So I believe the Magnificent Seven represents like over 30% of the S&P, hence they drive performance of that index. Since the Equal Weight Index was launched back in 1990, this is the biggest spread ever, okay? So again, in the same vein as technology stocks relative to U.S. small cap stocks, this is likely unsustainable. Either big tech needs to come back down to earth or some of the out-of-favor stocks and sectors need to rally. So think utilities, consumer staples, industrials, these old economy value-ish stocks that are deeply out of favor this year could rally to close this gap, but it's likely a combination of the two. But again, relative to history, which is 33 years, this is the biggest gap we've ever seen. Okay, we are in the middle of earnings season. So this is as of last Friday, I believe. And Q3 earnings, about half of the companies have reported. The red line is operating earnings for S&P companies. The blue line is gap earnings for S&P companies. Gap is generally accepted accounting principles. And what this tells me, and this goes back to 2009, is earnings have been pretty good. So this is back in 2021. This was the high, the earnings peak. This is halfway through third quarter of 2023. Earnings have been pretty good. What's not been good is CEOs and CFOs on these analyst calls are lowering their forward guidance. They're citing things like higher interest rates, geopolitical risks, uh, a tapped out consumer, unbalanced economy as headwinds for future earnings. Market doesn't like that. And I think stock price reactions post earnings, post earnings calls have been very poor. And there's a little bit of gamesmanship going on here too. So in general, when CEOs and CFOs revise lower guidance going forward, expectations go down which makes it easier for companies to meet expectations or exceed expectations in the future. Stock prices tend to go up in that environment. Conversely, when expectations are really high and they might come in lower, markets don't like that. So there's a bit of gamesmanship going on here, uh, but certainly a lot of the earnings calls that I've listened to uh, are saying the same things, which I just rattled off. It's certainly hard to predict the next quarter, the next few quarters, if you're a publicly traded company, and a lot of these folks, a lot of the C-suite will lean into being conservative because if you happen to set the bar low and exceed expectations, 
your stock price could react more favorably. The key takeaway is earnings, not a disaster. Forward earnings might be a little more challenged with an element of gamesmanship baked in. Let's get into real GDP. So this was the print in the third quarter of 2023, almost 5% annualized. Okay. No one can agree what a recession looks like. No one in their right mind would claim this is associated with a recession. Okay. So economic growth continues to perplex and defy many smart folks expectations. Looking back, and I've said this in previous blogs, it looks like we potentially could have had a recession in the first half of 2022. Technically, a recession is back-to-back -back quarters of negative GDP. We got that in the first half of 2022. Someone in the government along the way said that's no longer a valid uh, inflation, or not inflation, recessionary call. No one can agree on what a recession looks like. I know a recession does not look like this. When you unpack these numbers and what's driving this 4.9%, it's still the U.S. consumer, which continues to spend like an absolute maniac. When you further dive into the numbers, it's driven by folks aged 65 and greater, which control a good chunk of the wealth in this country. That cohort is driving much of this. They're spending like there's no tomorrow. And folks complain about inflation, the Fed is worried about inflation, it's really driven by you and I and our parents going out and buying stuff. And it continues to be a consumer story. Now, there are signs the consumer is getting stretched. Savings rates have gone down. Uh, late payments on credit cards and auto loans uh, have gone up. Certainly, the cost of money has gone up with credit card rates, auto loans, mortgages, all at uh, decade highs. So, this is probably unsustainable, and I, and I think you see future expectations for, for growth are much lower, but this was, all, this was also much lower uh, going into the quarter. The expectations were lower, and then we got this. So, you know, we continue to watch the U.S. consumer. We've said so goes the consumer, so goes the economy, but this caught a lot of people off guard. Okay, let's look at what the Fed is looking at. So the Fed likes to look at this core PCE as their favorite measure of inflation. And PCE is personal consumption expenditures. So they're looking at this metric as their inflation measure. And again, this is trending in the right direction. They're also looking at how tight monetary policy is. And anytime you get the Fed funds rate, which is this blue line above the core PCE inflation rate, that's restrictive monetary policy. Okay, so that's pumping the brakes on the economy, which we're starting to see uh, the effects of this, which there is a lag effect. It doesn't happen one to one. There is a lag effect between when the Fed raises rates and a slowdown in the economy. Policy hasn't been this restrictive since 2007. And we all know what happened uh, after 2007. The financial crisis happened. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen again. My takeaway from this, yours could be different. But anytime rates go from low to high in a relatively condensed period. And when you look at this, this was a very condensed period going from zero up to 5.25%. Same thing happened here, went from a slightly higher baseline, but rates went from low to high relatively quickly. Stuff tends to break and no one can predict what breaks. Take the banking crisis this year in the first quarter of 2023. No one had that on their radar. Uh, when Wall Street is making their predictions at the end of 2022. So there are likely more unintended consequences of this. I always say risk is what's left over after you've thought of everything. I know we're in this uh, hot take economy where everyone has an opinion on what happens next, but what derails us is often what you don't see coming. So there are likely monsters under the bed. I don't know what those are. No one knows what those are. This is the most restrictive monetary policy that we've had since 2006 or 2007. That's something to keep an eye on. Okay, earnings, S&P earnings yield less the 10-year treasury yield, 1962 to 2023. So back in 2016, back in here, right, when bond yields were basically at zero or much lower than they are today, there was an acronym called TINA. There is no alternative to equities, meaning irrational investors looking at the opportunity set out there on how to how to allocate their capital. Bond yields were very low. That made them unattractive relative to equities, which you were getting dividend income, 
that was a pretty good period for stocks. You had the opportunity potentially for your uh, stocks to go up. A lot of investors made that decision of shunning bonds, investing in the S&P 500. Fast forward to 2023, bond yields are much higher. The 10 years right around 4.8, 4.9%. Equities are fraught with risk. As we saw from one of our opening charts over the last two years, the S&P has done this. There's no shortage of things to worry about. Now a rational investor might say, I'm not willing to take on that equity risk. I'm going to park my money in 10-year treasury, get 4.8%. If the Fed pauses and then cuts, that's going to be a tailwind to my bond portfolio. So all that means is there is competition for equities, which potentially could be a headwind. However, this has happened before and stocks have exploded higher. So look no further than 2009. Same thing. We got kind of this parity between the earnings yield, the 10-year treasury yield, and this really was the beginning of a ravenous bull market for equities back in 2009. Same thing happened in 1980. You know, the 80s and 90s were a very good period for equities, and we hit this kind of parity moment multiple times throughout the 90s and the late 80s. So this is just something to watch. TINA, the acronym, there is no alternative to equities, is now dead. There is an alternative to equities. Uh, cash, short-term treasuries, longer-term treasuries are all yielding uh, much more normal uh, yields and rates. Let's get into some seasonality factors for the S&P. So we just finished one of the most unfavorable periods for S&P returns. And what this is, this goes by month, and it's the percentage of the time the S&P 500 is positive by month, 1945 to 2023. So you can see we're getting into a period where is only rivaled by March and April as being uh, overwhelmingly favorable. So almost 67% of the time in November, the market is up. That really goes higher in December, almost 76% higher in December. Of course, this is not gospel. You can't set your watch to it. But if this holds, seasonality factors could be a tailwind to the S&P 500. Now, zooming in a little bit uh, over the last 10 years, which is the green line, uh, and then the last I don't know, what is that? 40 years, almost 40 years, which is the blue line for the month of November. So S&P, month of November, intra-month performance. So the last 10 years, it's actually been really good, up over 3% for the S&P. Uh, zooming out a little further, over 40 years, it's up about 1.6%. So there's, there's a lot going on. This is a very confounding market. And oftentimes when you get these inflection points, and the market's not sure what the Fed does next. The Fed's talking tough on inflation. Uh, there's geopolitical issues. Inflation seen multiple stops and starts. The consumer's looking like they're stretched a bit. Forward guidance is going down from CEOs and CFOs. And then you're seeing, again, multi-asset class portfolios. So bonds, stocks, everything moving down together. That's deeply uncomfortable for investors. Um, no, that's probably stabilizes or normalizes once the Fed makes their next intention clear. It looks like they're going to pause in November. There could be one more hike in December. Once the Fed either pauses and then cuts, that should that should bode well. That should be a tailwind, especially to fixed income, fixed income portfolios, which have been beaten down. That should be a tailwind to uh, risky asset classes and bond portfolios. But right now we're in this convergent of factors where uh, everything's just a jumbled mess right now. So in this type of environment, most investors are gonna experience some pain. Our focus is on mitigating damage. Um, and, and as you saw, there's been few places to hide, but we do own gold, we do own short-term treasuries. Uh, and it's just a time where we're trying to keep it on the rails and, and just be patient and wait and be flexible and have a process for making decisions if things get better or if things get worse. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this provided context to a confounding, confusing market environment. Feel free to shoot us a note at Insight at Peer Portfolios if you have any questions or comments. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next month.